Ксения Евгеньевна, а можно ли понять, понять оккультный механизм действия обрядов? Ксения Евгеньевна, is it possible to understand the occult mechanism of rituals if we rely on the description of their structure in scientific literature? In principle, it is possible. Of course, it is more convenient to understand it through practical descriptions, because practitioners describe rituals as they perform them, while ethnographers, for example, describe them as they see them. The ethnographer's view cannot be completely objective. He may miss some important details. Thus, an element that is central to the right and natural to a magician will be unnoticeable to an ethnographer. Therefore, in order to form the structure of a right according to scientific sources, ethnographic materials and descriptions of ancient historians, it is necessary to dig through a huge amount of this type of literature. But still, the probability of making a mistake is much higher than if you study this topic based on some magic books, some scrolls or the descriptions of practitioners. Although they may not know the meaning of a particular step of the rite, they will not miss it in the description because it is an obligatory ritual action. But if we combine these two approaches to the study, we will get a more accurate sample. Of course, it will take a lot of time. But this is actually the way the structure of the ritual is calculated as a mathematical model, as a description of a rite, when there is a step-by-step -step transformation of a certain facet of being in a certain sequence of actions. Some cults considered such consistency very important. Let's take the Roman cult as an example. The Romans were the first to develop the rule of the required sequence of ritual actions. This was later transferred to Christianity, which was built on this foundation with the same well-defined structure. It also follows these rules. One step to the left, one step to the right, and the ritual was considered failed. And some cults believed that this rule was completely unnecessary. For example, ancient pagan traditions allowed a certain freedom to play, to experiment, and perhaps even to improvise. There, this sequence of steps doesn't play such an important role as it does in the rigid structuralism of the Roman, Abrahamic, and other traditions. So as you explore these questions, don't forget what tradition you're studying, because you won't find such a rigid structure of ritual in paganism, because as many erilas, volkvas or druids there are, as many rites they perform, because in paganism they are obliged to take everything into account. For example, what is the weather like today? Is it foggy or sunny? What day of the week it is? Where did the sun rise? What time did it rise? How is nature behaving? Have flower buds blossomed and have tree leaves curled up? They listen to the hooting of an owl and the chirping of a cricket. This tells them whether reality is ready to help them perform this rite or not. And when reality responds, the very structure within the consciousness immediately shifts. You know exactly, if this sign came from there, then I have to take this step before this one. Here, I have to bring offerings first, and then do everything else. And if this sign came from here, then I have to do everything else first, and then bring offerings. You must agree that these are different ritual structures. Pagans listen to the space around them, they know what they need and adjust their needs to the surrounding space, whereas monotheists will never do that. If the right did not work for them, then it did not work for them at all. They will not listen to the surrounding space unless it is written in the right. For example, the right says that people must wait until two eagles appear in the sky and then conduct the right. 
So if this rule is not fulfilled, the rite is not considered performed. It's written into the structure of the ritual, and it is an unshakable rule for them. But when they saw three eagles, that wasn't a big deal either. After all, the two required for the ritual are among them. So no problem, everything is all right, let's do the ritual. And for a pagan, three eagles could be a sign of both consent and refusal. That's why, when studying the structure of the rite through scientific literature, as we have said many times, always look at what tradition it comes from, who wrote it, who the author is, and what tradition the author himself belongs to. An author can describe a pagan rite being a Christian himself, and of course, he will describe it with his Christian consciousness, willingly or unwillingly, comparing the ritual that he is accustomed to seeing in the Christian church with what he sees in the pagan temple, and he will put his two cents in and his two cents may be totally inappropriate, they can completely distort the meaning of the information you're trying to find in that source. But I can assure you that a pagan describing a Christian rite makes the same mistake. He will not see how important it is for a Christian to follow the sequence of steps. He will probably be distracted by how people perceive this rite, how the fire behaves during the ritual, what is a good sign or a bad sign, and what it means when a priest drops the censer. He will be constantly distracted, and again, the rules of purity of perception will be violated. Therefore, before you rely on any literature, find out the source of its origin. The question of how to read the literature is covered in great detail in the very first lessons of the General Theory of Magic course. I think many of you are familiar with this video material. It is freely available on YouTube as well as on our forum. If you've forgotten it or haven't had a chance to familiarize yourself with it, review this material. I think you will learn a lot from it and avoid unnecessary mistakes, because sometimes we have to take information from the scientific literature and we have to be able to sift through it properly. For example, we take the information about some of the alchemical experiments that were done in the 15th and 16th centuries. We have a few manuscripts on the subject, a few notebooks, or maybe even works that have already been published. But we have to remember that they were left by someone who did the experiments and described them. It could be a Christian or a Muslim, and by the way, in Islam, the science of alchemy was very developed and can be called the forerunner of modern chemistry. And if we take the information from these sources literally, we will go astray, because nothing happened there without God's will, and the authors wrote about it on almost every page. In fact, they could not write anything else at that moment because they would have been burned at the stake and their names would have been forgotten. And so they had to write it because if they did not write 28 times on one page that all this is according to God's will, with God's permission, without the devil's intervention, not on their own initiative, then the fires of the Inquisition will not pass them by. You have to remember it, you have to see it, you have to understand it. And a bird language, which was used by the alchemists of the Middle Ages, was invented not only to keep this knowledge out of the hands of laymen, who might not understand anything of it, but the main thing was to keep it out of the hands of persecutors, 
and therefore everything should be sufficiently encrypted. Otherwise, it could have ended very badly. But at the same time, they were deeply religious people. They were very afraid of committing any act in their scientific or creative research that could destroy, shake in their minds some articles of faith or lead them into a certain state of sinfulness. So they did not describe everything in detail and avoided provocative stories, such as, for example, the process of taking the monthly blood of a virgin. It is clear that they did not write about it there, because it was not very proper from the point of view of Christian morality. I really hope, colleague Margarita, that I have answered your question quite thoroughly and clearly.